So welcome everybody to uh, today's seminar on uh, mouse lipidomics and uh, in which I'm going to answer the question whether mouse and lipidomics are actually a perfect match. So as you all know, mouse is used as a model system for the study of a variety of different diseases, such as um, metabolic diseases, cardiovascular diseases, but also neurological disorders and cancer and many, many more. And the mouse is used to study things like disease mechanisms, modes of drug action, treatment effects, metabolism in general. And these sort of studies that are conducted are, for example, time dose studies, biomarker identification studies, but also dietary intervention studies, and many, many more. And as you already uh, know, or as you all already know, is that uh, uh, lipids are very important and a very play a very important role in many of these diseases and these studies. And this is also uh, exemplified by the numbers of publications that we that we see for lipidomics. They are on the rise since uh, since ten years now. Uh, we see a fifteen fold increase uh, starting from two thousand and ten. So this shows that lipids are really gaining more and more attention. Uh, in, a, in a wide range of many different uh, research areas. To give you a short introduction on, on lipids in general, uh, it is clear that lipids are a structurally very heterogeneous group of molecules. For example, here we see uh, uh, an example of a glycerophospholipid, um, which can, for which structural diversity can be achieved by a variety of uh, uh, different things. For example, we can have many different uh, hydrocarbon side chains attached to the backbone of the molecule. So for example, these side chains can vary a number of double bonds, they can vary a number of carbon atoms, but also in the way they are linked to the hydrocarbon, uh, to, the, to the backbone of the lipid. Furthermore, uh, the head groups shown here in green uh, define the actual lipid class. So again, here we can achieve large uh, variety and in this way, thousands of different lipid molecules can be, uh, can be produced by our bodies. And where do we find these um, lipids, these molecules? If, for example, um, in lipoproteins. So as you all know, lipids are nutrients in our diet. And once we've eaten them, they enter our bloodstream in structures that are called uh, lipoprotein particles. And these lipoproteins consists of an outer shell that is made up of uh, phospholipids and cholesterol, as you, as you can see here. And in the core, we have uh, neutral storage lipids, such as the triglycerides or cholesterol esters. And these lipoproteins are the vehicles used by our bodies to transport these lipids to the various organs, where they serve as nutrients, but also as building blocks for cellular structures in the form of membranes. And membranes is the place where we, 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 we also, of course, find a lot of lipids because they actually uh, surround the cells and form intracellular structures, which are called organelles, as you all know. But not only do they form these boundaries, but they are also the medium uh, in which transmembrane proteins are embedded. And uh, it is important to know that about 30% of the proteome are actually transmembrane proteins, many of which play important roles in cell-cell interactions, uh, signaling processes, and other processes that are really fundamental to disease mechanisms in, for example, diabetes and cancer. So the way lipids are approached analytically has changed quite a bit in the past years. So as, as some of you might remember, initially uh, thin layer chromatography has been used to analyze the lipid composition on the lipid class level. So one would get a band for a phosphatidylcholine, for example, and that the strength of the band would tell us how much I have of this lipid in my sample. But then uh, with the advent of mass spectrometry based uh, lipid analysis technologies, it became possible um, to analyze lipidomes not only uh, on the lipid class level, but really on the level of individual lipid molecules. And this is actually this sort of technology that we at Lipotype uh, employ and exploit uh, we have established a shotgun lipidomics technology that, is, that really allows us the quantitative analysis of individual lipid molecules. And this technology I would like to introduce to you shortly, it comprises basically two essential parts. One, part one, is the um, lipid analysis itself, which typically consists of a lipid extraction done with um, mostly organic solvents, uh, depending on the sample type, different mixtures of chloroform and methanol. And this sample extraction is usually done in the 96 well format using uh, 
different uh, pipetting robots. So it's a fully automated process. Once the extracts are collected, this, uh, they are directly infused into the mass spectrometer for analysis. And for sample infusion, we, we use this little device here. It's, an, it's a, a nano electrospray ionization source, which allows us to infuse the extracts, the lipid extracts from our samples in a 96 well format directly into the mass spectrometer. And for mass spec analysis itself, we are using uh, Orbitrap technology with a very high mass resolution, which really allows us to deconvolute um, the very complex mass spectra that we are obtaining and to identify the lipids in these, in these mass spectra. The second important part of the whole workflow is the data analysis itself. So as, as you know, we, we obtain the mass, spec, uh, the mass spectra, but this is only masses. So we need to find out what lipids are actually hidden behind these masses. And for that, we have developed a software called Lipotype Explorer, which actually does the lipid identification in the mass spectra. It's a software based on um, a software called uh, Lipid Explorer that was developed in the uh, lab of Andrei Shevchenko at the Max Planck Institute here in Dresden. And we have taken up this software and tailored it to our needs, to our platform in order to make it really uh, uh, capable dealing with high throughput uh, projects and large numbers of samples. Lipid identification is of course, co of course an essential part of the whole story, but of course, data reporting and statistical analysis is almost as important because this is what actually gives meaning to our data. And also here we have done some work and developed tools like for example, Lipotype Zoom, which is a browser-based uh, platform that allows uh, our clients and collaborators to, to browse their lipidomics data online and do statistical analysis, multivariate testing and things like that. So as you can see, um, we have a whole platform covering the analytics itself, but also the data processing and statistical analysis. In lipidomics, we face a number of um, challenges and at Lipotype, we're offering solutions to, to actually any of these aspects. And I would like to focus now on the aspect of actual reproducibility and comparability of data. Um, what we usually do uh, uh, here at Lipotype for each matrix, which means for each sample type that we're looking at, we usually assess method performance, which includes parameters such as uh, precision, repeatability, but also linearity, sensitivity, and things like that. And um, here we show an example uh, for the assessment of method performance or method validation uh, that we have done for mouse liver. And it's just a short summary of the key results, which are uh, basically um, representative for any other matrix we are dealing with here. So we can obtain with our uh, technology a really excellent reproducibility. The technical variation in the data is usually less than 10%. We can cover a wide dynamic range spanning more than four orders of magnitude. And typically we achieve a pretty high sensitivity, which is in the nanomolar range that translates into uh, 0.0. 001 mole percent of uh, lipid content per sample. So it's really, can really go quite low. And uh, what is also important, especially when, when it comes to mouse samples, that we only require very low sample amounts. But I come to that aspect uh, a little later in more detail. Another very important challenge, and this is really what, uh, what the talk today is, is touching upon, is the, the aspect of lipid specific know-how. So we believe uh, that lipidomics really requires a dedicated approach and quite a bit of experience, not only to conduct the analysis itself, but also to make sense of the data and, and uh, interpret results. And, and what comes along with this is actually a deep knowledge of the experimental system. In, in that case, that we're talking today about the mouse. So um, that's why we are talking today about what we know about mouse lipidomes in different organs under different conditions. So in order to cover that aspect. It's pretty clear and it's known since century that acquiring a systematic knowledge of any system that one is going to study uh, always matters. Um, as this example shows here of uh, basically reproductive organs of plants as, uh, 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 as summarized by, by Linné. So almost 10 years ago, uh, we attempted a systematic characterization of lipidomes of the model system yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, under various standard lab conditions. So this, this data set, this project really allowed us to investigate a yeast lipidomic flexibility, which provides available baseline for lipidomic study in this uh, model system. And it is used since then 
uh, for us and uh, by us and by others to um, yeah to evaluate, interpret data, and judge quality of of samples and and the data that are acquired. So we thought we would actually need such a thing for mouse lipidomics, and um, and this need to know really more about the experimental system is also reflected by the questions we get from our customers and uh, collaborators. And these questions are, for example, how many mice do I actually need in order to run my experiment successfully in order to get significant uh, um, uh, hits results? Now, another important question we are getting is once people see the data, they are asking, okay, is this normal? Is this a normal lipidome for a blood sample or a brain sample or whatnot? Third question, is it really sufficient when I'm looking for a phenotype under certain conditions to look at the blood plasma because this is easy to collect? You all know the buzzword liquid biopsy. Is it sufficient to look at blood plasma or do I also need to sample organs or tissue material in order to see, see a meaningful result? And then once I have a meaningful result, or let's say once I have a result, then the question arises, is this phenotype really relevant or is it just like something that is okay, statistically significant, but it doesn't really, does it really answer my question? Is it really meaningful or is it just a random, random result that I've picked up? So we thought let's address these questions and the result of this um, is a recent publication on the flexibility of a mammalian lipidome uh, for which we used uh, the mouse to study uh, ex exactly this aspect. To go a little bit into the study design uh, of, the, of, this, of this publication, so we used mice of uh, different sex, males and females, two different genotypes. One is inbred, one is an outbred mouse strain on two different diets. One is a high protein diet and the other one is a low protein diet. And we collected 10 different sample types, full blood, blood plasma, liver, skeletal muscle, brain, kidney, adipose tissue, small intestine, lung and spleen. And we did so in triplicates. That resulted in a total of um, 240 samples and those we analyzed uh, with the shotgun epidemics technology that I have just introduced to you. And we were able to uh, quantitatively analyze 796 lipids in 24 distinct lipid classes. And in order to come to this result, we actually, as I mentioned earlier, needed only minimal sample amounts. Uh, and this table shows you uh, the specific numbers actually to give you a feeling. Um, for example, for blood samples, we really only need uh, one microliter of sample per extraction in order to get a meaningful result. For tissue samples, we only need a few hundred micrograms of material. So for brain, for example, we just need 80, liver 100. Uh, for others like muscle, we need a little more. But in general, we only need a few hundred micrograms of tissue material in order to conduct a full lipidomics analysis. So uh, now that we have measured all these samples, uh, we, we, we could start off and ask questions uh, in order to uh, yeah, uh, deepen our knowledge about our experimental system. We started off with the question, are lipidomes actually specific to organs, tissues, and even cells? And as you can see here, um, which on the slide where we show a principal component analysis on lipidomics data for these different uh, organs, you, you can clearly see that we see um, uh, a nice clustering of the lipidomes of the different organs in this principal component analysis. So for example, here, up here, we see the cluster for brain samples. Down here, we see uh, the cluster for, for the intestine samples. In general, each organ gives, to a, gives rise to a more or less specific lipid signature and to a very specific cluster in this principal component analysis. Um, this is the level of the lipid classes. Uh, no, this is the level of the individual, individual lipid molecules, actually. And, but you can, of course, also look at the uh, organ-specific lipid class composition. And here we see uh, that it's a, little, uh, uh, it's a lot of data, but just the bottom line is every organ has a very specific lipid class composition. This is, this is uh, the result of this experiment. And we can go a little deeper even and look at the fatty acid profiles and come to the same conclusion each organ shows a very specific fatty acid uh, profile. Um, so here again, this gives rise to the specificities and the classes that we've seen in the earlier, uh, in, the, in the previous slides. So this is on the level of the different organs, but we can dive deeper actually, and we have done so. 
When we, for example, um, uh, look into the lipid composition of different brain regions, such as cerebral cortex, hippocampus, or uh, amygdala, we see, again, highly specific lipid compositions, meaning that not only do the organs have a specific lipid composition, but even the tissues within the organs have a very specific lipid composition. And here, just to illustrate this statement with uh, like a superficial result, if you, if you wish, this is again a principal component analysis, and it shows us really that the different um, tissue samples, again, form distinct clusters uh, in the principal component analysis, speaking for the fact that really also the tissue composition within these organs can be very specific. And this is here exemplified for, for different types of uh, central nervous system parts. And we can dive even deeper than the tissue level. We can look also at the uh, cellular level. So we have done lipidomics on oligodendrocytes, microglia, neurons, and astrocytes, which are essentially the uh, neuronal cell types. And we see a very similar uh, result as we have seen before on the, on, on the other levels. Again, each cell type has a very specific lipidome, uh, as you can uh, easily uh, recognize here by the different clusters, again, in the principal component analysis. And it's not only that, we also see that lipidomes evolve in the course of cellular differentiation. So we can even see a specific, um, yeah, so to say, specialization of the lipidome through the course of the differentiation of different cell lines. And you could do this sort of analysis for the oligodendrocytes, but also for the neurons. So not only does um, our lipidome specific for different organs, tissues, and even cell types, but even the developmental stages of the cell types, for example, also matter. So the next uh, question uh, this data set allowed us to address was, are there organ-specific lipid class profiles, actually? Um, to remind you, in addition to the compositional complexity that we have just looked at, there's a large degree of structural complexity when we talk about lipids. Um, but we wonder whether some of the lipid classes take, can take on a larger variety of different fatty acid side chains, for example, uh, giving rise to a, a larger variability of their uh, lipid species composition. And uh, to illustrate the different lipid class compositions in different organs, um, we calculated the, uh, the average fatty acid chain length and the average double bond number for each lipid class in each organ, basically. And the result of such the calculation uh, is shown here. So in this plot, we have on the x-axis um, the average number of double bonds. And on the y-axis, we have the average fatty acid chain length. And each dot in this plot represents one sample. So we have done that for each sample for every organ. And what you can see here really is that the specific organs form very tight clusters of dots, meaning they have a very distinct and very specific um, lipid class composition. In that case, for phosphatidylcholine here in brain, same we see for lung. Phosphatidylcholine lung also seems to have a very tight, very tightly controlled lipid. Um, species composition, while other organs such as here, this, this uh, purple uh, uh, cloud of dots, uh, the spleen takes on a larger uh, variety of double bond uh, numbers and fatty acid chain links. And um, so what we wanted to do now, we wanted to quantitatively express uh, this, these differences between the different organs. And what we did is we simply calculated um, the area that is based on the uh, range of the two parameters we have plotted here, meaning that we get rectangles for the different classes for which we then can calculate, uh, so say the area, and this area we call um, lipidomic plasticity. And we define this lipidomic plasticity as the degree of structural heterogeneity or variation within a given lipid class based on the varieties of fatty acids that uh, uh, can be incorporated into a specific lipid class. And we calculated this plasticity, plasticity parameter for the different lipid classes and different organs, as shown here. But let's focus on one class for simplicity, which is phosphatidylcholine. What we get out of this calculation is that, for example, spleen, as we've seen before, has a very high plasticity of its phosphatidylcholine lipid composition, while, for example, lung, but also the brain, um, has a rather narrow um, lipid species composition for phosphatidylcholines. Um, 
meaning that in every organ, we find a very distinct pattern of lipid species for each lipid class. And in some, this pattern is more variable than in others. In others, it can be very strictly defined. So this plasticity is really organ specific. So as I said, there is organ specific lipid class composition, but the, 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 the variety or the variability that can be taken on meaning the plasticity depends really on an organ. Another question we, are, uh, we were able to address with this data set was uh, whether lipidomes of the different organs are actually affected by factors such as diet, sex, or genotype. And if so, to what extent are they affected? So what we did in order to answer this uh, question is a linear regression analysis um, with lipid class amounts, averaged unsaturation, averaged chain length, um, in order to identify uh, whether there are any significant changes imposed by these factors, diet, sex, and genotype. And the factorial design of the study allowed us really to investigate these effects, diet, sex, and genotype, independently of each other. So the result of such an analysis looks like this. We basically obtain uh, beta coefficients from the linear regression, which, which are essentially slopes for the different parameters. Here for dietary effects um, in, in the liver, and what we did in order to really find, uh, uh, find, um, uh, find a more generalized expression for the variability of the liver lipidome, we added up all these beta coefficients that were significantly different from zero uh, in order to calculate um, um, yeah, which organ actually responds strongest to the conditions that we have tested. And this response to the different conditions we call lipidomic flexibility. And here's the definition once more to, to, to make it clear. Uh, the lipidomic flexibility we, we, we call a quantitative measure for the magnitude of changes in the lipidome or parts of the lipidome induced by certain experimental conditions. So here's the summary of the result, basically. Uh, you see here uh, color-coded the different organs in the mice under the different conditions we have looked at. And I would like to highlight uh, two, three uh, notable, notable results. First is that the liver shown here and the, the circulation, which is essentially full blood or plasma, very often are very red, so to say, meaning they have a very high flexibility of the lipidome as imposed by differences in genotype, uh, diet, or sex. On the other hand, we have organs that do not respond to some of these conditions, like for example, the brain. For in the brain, we don't see any flexibility in response to diet or sex, but we see a very strong uh, impact of the genotype actually on the brain lipid composition and that we found quite interesting. Similarly for adipose tissue we also have a very specific effect imposed by the diet but we don't get a, a genotype uh, induced or a, a sex induced effect in the lipid composition of the adipose tissue. So this really means that yes lipid lipidomes are really affected by the genotype, uh, diet and sex but the extent um, to which they are affected. So the extent of the flexibility really depends on the organ in question. So it cannot really be, be generalized. Um, so now we can make the thing a little more complicated and can ask the question, does the phenotype actually depend uh, on the genetic background or the sex of the animal that I'm looking at? And uh, we are here looking at, since we use diet as one of the parameters, we, uh, we looked at dietary phenotypes. So in that experiment, the diet was our treatment and we treated mice, of course, of different uh, genetic background and sex to, to find out. And what we observed was, um, and here we look at, at the kidney and the um, effect of different diets on, um, on the, unset, the degree of unsaturation or the number of double bonds in phosphatidyl ethanolamine. What we observed was that in inbred mice, we actually see a reduction of the numbers of double bonds in PE on high protein diet as compared to low protein diet. However, when we look at the outbred mouse strain, we see an increase of the number of double bonds in, um, uh, in high protein diet as compared to low protein diet. So uh, that led us to do a more uh, systematic analysis because we thought, okay, maybe there is really a systematic differential effect here. So we did, again, a multiple linear regression analysis, and this time we included interaction terms for diet, sex, and the genotype um, in order to identify sex and genotype-specific dietary effects. And what we see here, just as an illustration, is the result for dietary effects in kidney. And we could indeed find 
um, that there are lots of differential effects for different lipidomic parameters. And we saw this across all organs and also um, not only uh, induced by, by the genotype, inbred versus outbred mice, but also depending on the sex of the mouse. So in summary, yes, geno uh, phenotypes, uh, in this case induced by different diets, clearly can depend on the sex of the mouse and the genetic uh, background of the mouse. And this is something that po uh, probably should also be considered in other intervention studies, like for example, drug treatments. Um, Okay, now, since we had all this data, we were also able to ask the question, are changes in the organ lipidomes actually reflected in the blood? Or in other words, is it sufficient to screen blood lipidomes for phenotypes, or should I rather look into uh, specific organ lipidomes? And the answer is, hmm, it depends. So it really depends on the, um, on the organ again. So this is a, a correlation analysis for all organs against uh, blood plasma. And we use the correlation coefficients for clustering. And this is a zoom in to make it more uh, comprehensible. So for this clustering analysis, we use plasma. Blood plasma is a reference point and we use only significant positive correlations for this clustering analysis. And it turns out that sort of as a positive control, full blood is uh, clustering very closely with plasma. Makes sense because they share a lot of lipids. Uh, and liver clusters next to plasma in full blood, meaning that the liver lipidome is best reflected um, in the blood lipidome uh, as compared to other organs, like for example, the brain, which is uh, barely uh, reflected with regard to lipid composition in the blood. So um, meaning that actually liver is well reflected, other organs are not so well reflected. And to just to exemplify this, a little better. Here we see um, a plot showing the mean number, double bond number in the body fluid for triglycerides. And here as we see on the y-axis the mean double bond number for the, uh, for the triglycerides in liver tissue. And you can see here that there is a nice uh, correlation between the two parameters. Um, yeah, uh, providing the evidence that this correlation analysis uh, that we've shown earlier makes sense and, and that really liver can be nicely um, um, uh, represented in the blood sample under the circumstances we have tested here. Therefore, organ lipidomes might be well reflected in the blood, uh, like for example, liver, uh, but mostly they seem to be not very well reflected, at least under the conditions we have tested here. And with that, I'm coming already to the uh, conclusions of my talk. Um, so what we have seen in, with our analysis is uh, of the analysis of lipidome plasticity and flexibility, that there is a, um, a, a strong relationship between structure, function, and composition of the, uh, an organ and its lipidome. So if um, uh, the lipid composition is essential for the function for uh, uh, an organ or a tissue, then the lipid composition appears to be, appears to be uh, pretty much conserved. Um, to give you one example, here uh, we look at um, a neuron, which is a major type of cell in the brain, obviously, uh, with its uh, uh, axon and with a myelin sheath around it. So meaning that here the structure is made up of the myelin sheath, which is, which is rich in lipids, phosphatylethanolamine ethers, but also um, So they are, they are really essential to build up these structures. That's why we see a very conserved lipid composition in the brain for example. But this can also be extended to other organs. Let's look, for example, at the lung. Um, in lung, we also saw a very conserved uh, composition of the phosphatidylcholine lipids, right? And, and this is because phosphatidylcholine, in particular, deep material phosphatidylcholine, is an important surfactant um, in the alveolar sacs that actually uh, prevents uh, these sacs from collapsing and allowing us to breathe uh, properly. So here again, we see if, if the lipids have a very uh, important structural functions, their composition is usually very well conserved. It is different in other cases. For example, if an organ uh, fulfills rather metabolic functions like the liver, for example, we see lots of variation in the lipidomes simply because uh, um, this organ is exposed to what we eat or what the mouse eats in that case and is also responsible for, for maintaining the homeostasis throughout the entire body. So essentially, uh, the, the bottom line of uh, this talk is uh, that 
And with regard to lipidomics, lipid composition of the different mouse organs, everything seems to matter to some degree. Um, yeah, so we, we really should expect everything uh, to, to have an effect on the organs, lipidomics. So organ, sex, genotype, and diet-specific effects. Um, the variability of the organs also uh, um, uh, plays a role and is different between the different organs. And, uh, and we also see organ-specific lipid, uh, lipid phenotypes that are not necessarily reflected in the blood. And we see that phenotypes really depend on uh, genetic background and the sex, and perhaps also other factors that we haven't even looked at here in this study. So uh, in the end, what is this knowledge good for? Um, so one important uh, and really tangible aspect is uh, one can use this data set nicely for the analysis of, of statistical power. So what we are uh, doing or what we are going to do is really to, to, to take the data and based on the data that we have measured, like these shown here on the left-hand side, uh, we can estimate effect sizes, we can estimate uh, uh, distributions from these data, and this allows us to simulate um, statistical power in the end. Uh, and these simulations would allow us to tell uh, our collaborators and clients uh, how many mice they will need in order to see a phenotype with a given um, effect size in, in the lipidome of a specific organ. So we can really uh, give you information on the sample number that is required for a lipidomic study in mouse. What else? Um, so the mouse lipidomics data gives results um, a context. So we can now, or, or our clients can now look into um, uh, uh, the literature and see, okay, this is a normal lipidome for brain or liver and can compare their data uh, with what's published. And that would increase confidence in the results and also facilitates interpreta interpretation of lipidomics data sets. And as I said, uh, based on statistical power analysis, it can will also inform the experimental uh, design. Um, this data set also provides us uh, uh, with the answers to the questions uh, that we have initially stated. So for example, is this a normal lipidome? Is it sufficient to look at blood plasma and so on and so forth? So I think these answers, uh, these answers can now be uh, confidently uh, provided and can be even backed with a comprehensive data set. So coming back to our initial question, uh, mouse and epidemics, is it really a perfect match? Well, uh, first of all, we have, as I sh I've shown uh, in the beginning, uh, we've seen excellent technical performance for lipidomics, uh, shotgun lipidomics for mouse samples, which is good. Uh, we require only low sample amounts, which is important for mouse since it's a tiny animal, right? And um, it was also an important aspect is that the mouse lipidome is very similar to the human lipidome. Of course, there are quantitative differences, but qualitatively, it's more or less the same, which is a very important aspect in translational research. And we now have a comprehensive knowledge of the mouse organ tissue and cells lipid composition, which really helps us to judge data quality and the relevance of uh, phenotypes that we might see in different studies. And we now know about the biological variability and how it is coming about, which is important for experimental design and data interpretation. So uh, mouse and epidomics, is it really a perfect match? I would certainly say so.